what advice would you give any young people thinking that they want to make a big change or they want to take that leap, but they're not sure whether to do that or not? I can easily answer that. My, my mentor once told me three things when you're making a major choice, and I've lived by this. Three things to consider. Number one is your peace. You know, with your, like I had my integrity. My, my mind was saying, do the educational law stuff. Not there's anything wrong with that. To all the lawyers listening, you're amazing. <laughs> um, um, but my heart was saying this. So my, pe- my peace, I'd lost my peace. I was stewing about it. I was frustrated. With, I, was, I couldn't. So you listen to your peace. And if you don't have your peace, you, you, no one should live like that. Every, you, you should make career choices and major life choices. You've got to have your peace. Because you've got to be able to look yourself in the mirror and go, I've spent whatever long mm. doing this. So you listen to your peace. Listen to your counsel. Listen to your advisors, your counsellors. Like I did, I was, my parents, my coaches, my pastors, my friends, mm. and I listened. Um, and like I said, that first window, there was a mm-mm, and so I, I listened to that so that the next time when they said yes, I was like, sweet, I, mm. I've got this. Mm. And then the last thing is... Phil Newman, Phil, how are we? I'm good, I'm good. I'm glad to be here and um, I just think what you're doing is amazing and I'm just awesome. really honoured to be a part of it. Mate, we appreciate you coming on big time. Um, you're someone that I've, you know, you might not even know, but I've looked up to quite a bit, uh, especially helping me through stuff that I've been through. So let's give these boys a little bit of context uh, as to who you are, what you're about and what you're doing currently. Well, uh, I'm, my name's Phil. I'm married to one wife. Her name's Tam. It's this new thing. Great one stuff. wife, yeah. One little beautiful <laughs> daughter. And uh, work-wise, I'm the lead pastor of Impact Church. I'm a pastor by trade, but in that it involves like counselling people, management of you know budgets and people and teams, and speak around the place. And I do a lot of public speaking every week. I'll be speaking and training and helping people, and then all the other stuff that comes with a big organisation, what it takes to run that. Mm. And Impact's just had a recent makeover, you could say, up here. Yeah, yeah. How's everything settling in? Yeah, good. It's always something new. It's definitely not a job that you get stale in, not, a, not at a culture and environment that there's, you know, nothing so, Nothing is happening. It's always something new. And so we just went through a big renovation and yeah, we're already planning it onto the next thing, which is pretty cool. Mm. And I think, I mean, we should say thank you at the start anyway because we're now in one of the rooms that you've set up here for us mate from let's let's go back a little bit um grew up on the coast yeah i grew up here so born in sydney but moved here when i was two or three Mm. and um yeah coasty boy my whole life i love it here and how how did you move into the world of pastoring and 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 where you are now because i know it was such a different area that you were honing in on and it was yeah. more law and it's a bit unusual yeah so i at school i was a um uh, similar to you mitch like a hd student like, uh, <laughs> like <laughs> great marks but I, like, I, I was naturally like uh intellectual like studied hard i loved it um you know high marks high back then it was called a uai i don't know it's called now an atar or yep. yep um so you know really could kind of into uni do anything i wanted and so i was sort of going down the road of law or architecture, they were the two things that I loved. And similarly, like super, I'm super creative in how I think and plan and played music my whole life. So I had that kind of part to my life, but then, you know, was super academic. So it was going down the road of law or architecture. And, um, and it suited my plan, it suited my education, everyone's expectation, all my family, all my teachers, all my lecturers, it was sort of like all, all the grand plan. Meanwhile, I you know, grew up a church kid. My parents came to um, our church actually, so I kind of grew up in that environment. Um, but when I was 19, 20 at uni, just had this incredible um, heart change of, you know, I actually want to um, serve people and help people and, mm. Um, in the end, I, had, I honestly had a bit of a battle between my head and my heart. And my heart was saying people, um, were saying my faith, was saying, you know, go down this road. My head and, and the 
whatever it is, 18 years of schooling, or, you mm. know, whatever it is, was saying, but you've done all this investing, you've done all this planning. Mm-hmm. But um, so it was, a, it was a massive step. Like it was a big, courageous right-hand turn of life mm. to do something that isn't known for its intellect and isn't known for its HD marks and isn't mm. known for all this and to kind of go, I've got to be true to my heart and, and be integrous and be able to go, hey, I've done with my life what I know I should have and could have. Mm. I want to I want to ask two questions off the back of that. Um, <clears throat> the first is, did you know when you're listening to your heart, because obviously you would have been surrounded by a community of people who were very supportive um, in wanting to make that change or even thinking of it. Did you know that, did you have a direction or know that you could make a career if you did decide to follow that? Um, and what what did you love so much about law? Because even architecture, law, and then pastoring or, or um, the way that you ended up going, uh, three polar opposites yeah. I, and i think probably that was my wrestle was was uh, you know i didn't just have one interest and mm-hmm. i wasn't wired just to do one thing um i think for yourself surrounded by people um there's actually um a window about six months or a year before i started when i it actually started to come up and i talked to kind of my mentors and coaches and my parents and people then and it was interesting, like, even though I knew my heart was starting to do this, some of them actually were like, oh, we don't feel like you should, or we don't feel like it's time, or we don't feel like, it, there wasn't like this big yes. Mm-hmm. And I've always, I've always, growing up, I've always been kind of a very honouring, honourable person who really, I've always taken people's perspectives quite strongly mm-hmm. and thought like I don't just want to be the jerk who thinks I know it all and, and stuff is all I'm going to go do what I think and so I actually even though my heart was like really starting to fire up for this when there was enough doubt from other people that I respected I actually said okay I, I'm not going to push it I'm going to wait and I'm going to keep keep on this path I went back to uni did another semester mm. And even though my heart was like, you know, mm. fired up and, and I um, I was starting to wonder, am I going to miss it? Am I going to miss my moment, miss mm. my wave? And then six months or whatever it was later, I revisited again. I was like, guys, I can't shake this. And then everyone was unanimously yes. And, yeah. and, I did, and I, I'm really glad that I did that because it meant that I headed in your direction my, really my direction i was really conf- i had confidence yep. because i knew all my advisors are in this and have endorsed mm. this and mm. they give me wisdom around it but there's a big yes yeah so i could kind of go great full steam ahead rather than i'm doing it and my coach doesn't oh, he's kind of doubtful yep. uh, and i'd always I, I would probably carry that in the back of my head and i'd second guess and i would so i was i was so glad that i just held off six months and I just, I just think sometimes it's good to wait a bit and test it, make yep. sure, especially for a, a, such a life change. Mm. Um, for those, sure for those um, who said no in the beginning, did you ever ask them why they said no after? Oh, a million percent. Like they, they were um, not wanting me to throw away my um, education. Like mm-hmm. you know, I, I, I honestly, like guys, I, I went. My family and I went super deep with my education to the point where I finished school and did like went did psychologist tests and and ink block tests and all this sort of stuff wow. to actually nail my aptitude and ten career choices that would suit my wiring. Like mm-hmm. I went, we went deep, like we took it seriously, and I loved it. And um, so it was like we've done all this, buddy. You better know, like mm. you yeah. Better. And so they just said, look. Just you got to wait. Almost like, almost like um, a friend of mine has a policy. He doesn't get a tattoo until he wants it for a year. Okay. Then he'll do it. <laughs> Good and policy. It's almost, like it's almost like that. Like this is so permanent yeah. or yep. so impacting. You better make sure. Just, just test it. Mm. So they were never, no, you couldn't do it. They all, they all said you'd be great at it. Yeah. But it was more an issue of just, I hope you're just not super keen. Like, you know, I've mm. had too much pizza. Yeah. <laughs> you know what I mean? Yeah. Saw a movie and got all this inspiration. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. So, um, 
So that was more the sense of it. You know, financially, law, architecture, all these careers were financially far more, at that stage, what, what I would say, more secure, more ma- you could predict more the pathway that it would be. Yeah. Pastoring or ministry was way more unpredictable in what it would be. Yeah. And so it was just, you know, just like any parent and any coach would say, follow your dreams, but just with wisdom, with some checks and balances, mm. with some timing. Yep. And I'm honestly, I'm just so glad that I just sat and tested it because yep. it, even then I know, I know now I've done it for 20 years. I've got my second long service leave. I've got six months of long service leave this year. I've done it for 20 years wow. at our church. Wow. Mm. And I just, in the, in the really cruddy times of that, I still know in my heart, I know that's what I'm meant to do. Yeah. And it's because mm. I've tested it. You know, yeah, so I'm that. like, I'm glad you guys kept the reins on me because I know, you know mm. no one could convince me otherwise. Yeah. You, you seem like you had, uh, and still do, I know, such a supportive group around you. When you were in, sort of leaving school, 17, 18, 19, did you have go-to mentors? I know there's people that I, like Lane, for example, who we're going to have on another episode. He's someone I definitely look up to and I confide in a lot. You have people like that post school and, and leaving school at yeah. that time. And I think, like I found that in my church environment, so it it, it operated very men- it operates very mentory in style and culture. Like yeah. you're in a you're in a, um, a group of you know young guys your age, and you've got someone five years older who, as you're a teenager, they just kind of yeah heard you, encourage you, keep mm. you on hopefully on some sort of track. So I finished school with my crew yeah. with that guy plus then the pastor of our church. So I kind of was in an environment that scaffolded me, kept me in place mm. while I was bouncing around making these calls. And yeah. so... Mm-hmm. Um, That's cool. Like and that. so that that was like, I, I want to do that for other people. I, I can now provide that. Yeah. What, what I grew up in, I can now help build for others. Yeah. Mm. And so where did the career, where did that career start for you, that new career? What, where did you go from when yeah. you took that leap? So it started by our, what was it, our senior pastor asking me to um, be his like assistant, which it, um, it, back then there was no fancy job descriptions, no, no inductions. It was just like, you, you want to in like, he, he kind of said, I want to give you an opportunity. I can see that you would be okay at this. But it was basically like just come be an assistant secretary kind of thing, and I I was the worst secretary. It was kind of, it was bad money, it was paperwork, it was rosters, it was admin, mm. not coffees with people, encouraging people. <laughs> not like it is now. Not coffees like, with everyone. Yeah, 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 yeah. That's all the pastors here, right? Just have coffees with everyone. Yeah. Was this was this impact at the time? Yeah, it had a different name, but yeah, it was it was our church. And here. Yep. Yeah, wow. Well, yeah. Okay. yeah. So I went to youth group here and. Friday nights, and then I started working here um, in 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 an office, and um, mm-hmm. just just did whatever. And then that being in the organisation, it's a great church, great organisation for pathway. So then mm-hmm. I got my credential, became a pastor, went through the training, and just you know went went from there. And now I'm the lead pastor, and so now it's it's great privilege to run it. Yeah, and um, what was it like the first time you got on on stage? Uh, I um, first time I got on stage, I I was a youth pastor. That was my first major role. I did it for like ten years, and um, definitely not as cool as Mitch. So I was. Uh, all you had, and he got something to worry about. Yeah, he was in there as well. Yeah. Oh, That's all right. <laughs> well, I I grew up, so I was a HD kid. So I was like, I was geeky before. It was cool to be geeky. So right. I was, um, I grew up Mitch, just, yeah. <laughs> I can see you crying. I'm fighting. Right There's a couple of things. Just the one I, that just popped up was um, okay. your photo of you in there. Man, he sprouted late in life. I had yeah. long hair, could have long hair and straighten it every day and all of our crew would just have big long fringes and, oh, nice. and we would just oh, we just thought we were awesome and we were so bad. But So I've got hope. Yeah. Yes. <laughs> but I look, I grew up playing classical music and, and I didn't surf and didn't skate and I was I, I was um, had a great circle of friends, but 
to speak in front of high school students who eat you alive and very happy mm. to show you if they hate you and don't find you funny and mm. don't find what you're saying, you know, you know, decent. Um, so it was every bit of insecurity and shyness and everything in me mm. just for, especially the first time, but for that first season, it, I, it was the most terrifying. I would be shaking, I would be jeering, and all I had was, I know I'm meant to do this mm. and I've got something that they need to hear. And I would get up at schools and just do school assemblies and do school chapels and just give my give my all and slowly by slowly um, figured out how to, not just how to public speak, but mostly how to conquer my own insecurities yeah. and my own fears. And once I mm. had that, then I was re- I actually super embraced my geekiness, my, my not my geekiness, my, my personality and yep. who I was and and then you know I'm in Aaron in Aaron High in Terrible High mm. in, and just as soon as I had my rest mm. it just cracked open how good we actually touched on I think it was only last week Phil was telling me about <clears throat> um Aaron High School he was doing talks there and what was it your wedding day yeah. Was it? And the, the kids actually turned up? I can add to that story in the last two days. Yeah. <laughs> we, we used to do this high school program, 10-week um, course with troubled, uh, oh, well, troubled, I don't know if that's the DC term, um, uh, young guys who were struggling at school, struggling with family environments, mm. and the school I identified, they need mentoring or they need, they need that right. sort of support and guidance, mm. right? And so we did this course, we go in, and again, so I, it's taking shy, insecure Phil and sticking now not just with any with the ones who will, you know, you know, they give it will to you if they give need it to me. <laughs> but thank goodness, like I was past all of that and I was like, okay, anyway, so I'm doing this course, it's year nine guys, it's year 10 guys, and just over those months, you just forge something so, you know, unreal mm-hmm. with them. Like that, you do become a big brother. You do become a mentor, and so some a handful of these guys, um, you know, you really do get a great connection with. You see them there and fair, and you go have coffee and hang out and all this stuff. Even out, even once you pass it all. Some of my wedding day, and my my boys, probably five or six of them from Erin High Strength Year Nine, and I'm 25 with my long hair that Mitch is. <laughs> Um, <laughs> it's so bad. It was so bad. Um, they come to my wedding, and there's hundreds of people there in the wedding. And my wedding photo of the big group wedding shot is at the front row. It's all my, all my family. Everyone's not in the front row. The front row is my bridal party and the strength. And my it was called strength, of course. And my boys just in the front row. And for some reason, one of them's got my wife's bouquet. And, <laughs> So, so my wedding photo for oh. these boys. So Forever. Mitch, you, I promise you, from a hand on my heart, three days ago. So three days. Um, Do we just speak about that? Yeah, three days ago. So this is this would be, I've been married 13 years. So this would be 15 years ago mm. I did this course. Three days ago, one of those boys messages me on Facebook no and way. says, hey, Phil, I don't know if you remember me. Um, and just opens up this conversation and we're catching up next week. You're kidding. And nice. I was just like, it was one of those moments where I'm like, this is why I do what I do. Yeah. Like, yeah. This is why in no other scenario would someone like me ever have, ever catch up with someone like him. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And it's sure. just a privilege. I'm just like, far out. But it's How just good. hilarious. My wedding photo has just these punk kids with their long hair, the bad boys, and they're just like, yeah, with my wife's okay. And I'm like, oh my God. How this good. Is great. Uh, probably good little lead in to Tamiya. I want to, sorry, before we do that, because yeah. I had a niggling question. That time, because year nine guys, they're like mm. the rowdiest of the rowdiest. They can be the, yes. the, the probably the most uh, common age to really muck up and, and not care. And so I really wanted to ask you how, how you managed to get through to them. Obviously, it was time. And was there anything that, anything that you used or anything that you knew, whether it was just your confidence? Um, I, I think that they don't care what you say. Like they, yep. sorry, they don't care what your, their, what your lesson is. Yep. They want to know that you 
and care about them. And mm. it takes them a while to admit that, mm-hmm. that, they, that no young guy is going to straight up go, I just, want to, I just want you to be my friend. Like yeah. it's never, it's never going to be that straight up. But I think one of the things a lot of young guys crave is just loyalty, consistent, like consistency. If you were to show yeah. up, that's, I think mm. that's more than a lot of them are experiencing in other areas of their life. Just yeah. someone who will just show up unconditionally, week in, week out, day in, day out. And so the fact that we would do that mm. just gives time and space for a little bit of trust to form. Yeah. And I think that's, um, I th- I do think that's what a lot of people, I think that's what a lot of people crave is um, someone who will not judge, not not expose, not point a finger, but just go, I'm, just, I'm, I'm here and I'm going to be here and I hope you're here and, and, and I do think that's something that I do well is I just I've always said I'm just going to show up so cool um, and, and I've watched superstars come and superstars go and confident people come and confident and, and I, I, I don't know if it's because I'm dumb or if it's that I'm consi- I, I disciplined I don't know what it is but I've always had the nature of I'm just going to do whatever I commit to I'm just going to do it and, mm-hmm. and that's why like in my training and, and my fitness I just, I'll, I'll just do it, yeah. and 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 I'm just, just got that ability to discipline, and I think that's what those young guys respond to is yeah. someone who just shows up, and the, and they've got nothing in common except we're together. Yeah. Okay. After two months, yeah, you've shown up more than anyone else has, and I've mm. tried to scare you off, and I've tried to make you hate me, and I've tried to get some sort of reaction, mm. but you keep coming. All right. Well let's let's try a bit and, and I think I find that's what happens mm. it's fascinating because and the reason I asked that question is because I saw the exact same thing happen in my school exactly. and um, we we had some guys from um, church in Gosford who would come in went to Henry Kendall so they would come in there was two or three of them but there was one guy who would always show up Jason and um, he attracted the I guess you would call them the coolest in our year, but really the guys who craved essentially the most attention, the guys who were the hardest to crack, um, but the guys who, when they thought something was cool, they latched onto it. And Jason was that person. And and that was probably year nine, year 10. And that was for a a few years to the point, exactly the same. They used to go surfing with him. Um, They used to go for coffee with him. He'd drop them at school. Like it's just, and I I went to a few of those and, it was just conversation. Yeah. He wasn't exactly probably how you uh, approach it is it was just, he was just there yeah. and he was just, mm-hmm. he was trusting um, and he had a, a great energy about him. Um, he wasn't trying to be anyone who he wasn't. And I've seen him speak um, at the church a couple of times and I'm just like, no wonder. Yeah. It just all makes sense. Yeah. Um, so yeah, um, let's go back. Let's Before I was that. rudely cut off. <laughs> uh, yeah. I'm going to talk about my... Your beautiful wife. Hot Asian wife. Ah, yes. uh, we do. <laughs> we do. Um, you, you guys met through the church, yes? Yeah, yeah. yeah. We went to youth together and yeah. we, were, we, we knew each other for years and had that kind of almost like a bit of a brother-sister kind of relation where we hated each other, loved each other mm. kind of thing. And then um, it was like, oh, oh. Yeah, I, I found it really annoying and really irritating and didn't have any chemistry with her. And I remember the night that we have known each other for six years or something. And I remember we went to a wedding, not together, but with a mutual friend. And I remember sitting at the reception and I, looked, and I looked across the room at her. And for the first time ever, I was like, she is amazing. Like, she is so hot. She's amazing. And, I, and my follow up thought was, oh no. It's her. Like, oh, it's her. <laughs> <laughs> And, and so then I, you know, because I'm so, you know, cool, um, just <laughs> descended into teasing her, paying her out, my, you know, when, when I went full high school. And, um, How old were you at this, this stage? 23. Okay. 18, I was 23, 24. And, um, yeah, and, and we could we knew each other so well. Once we started dating, it was like... It was a bit like we're gonna date, but it, you know, if we do this, it's kind of just to make sure that you're not a psycho. Yeah. Same about me, because if we date, we're gonna. This is it. Like we knew each other. There was no big secret. So we only dated 
I think six months or something, and then uh, I proposed and yep. we engaged wow. for nine months because we were like we knew we knew each other inside out. Yeah. Um, yeah, it was just very funny. One day, I just became like I was just like, oh, it's her. Oh, no. I'd be like, oh no, and so it became this quest to, um, you know, melt the ice queen's heart. And uh, <laughs> and you guys been, you say married for thirteen? Married for thirteen years. Oh, wow. So we, um, yeah, she's she's the love of my life. She's my mm-hmm. best friend. I just, I just love her. She's wildly wicked in you know in humor and mm. she's the funniest zany- she's the zaniest person i know yeah. she really is and um but very um very compassionate mm. very discerning thing- things that i'm not naturally like she is and mm. so she's such a gift to me she's mm. relaxed me and you know teaches me so much and keeps me out of a lot of trouble because she'll read people and read situations really well whereas i'm like yeah, this is fine. She's like, mm, babe, just, you know, just, just laugh. Just, yeah. Yeah. Just it. <laughs> it's key yeah, to a perfect right. relationship. Yeah. yeah. Balance, all right? Yeah. Um, I mean, I'd, I'd love to dive into something that I know you uh, want to talk about as well. Um, the, the conceiving situation and, and the conceiving <laughs> situation. Uh, but your struggles uh, with... Yeah, yeah, yeah. I'm like, how do I wear this to sound professional? Mm. Yeah, the banging, the banging thing. Uh, but I'll let you you dive into this a little bit more. Yeah, so we been married 13 years, and after um, I reckon, because Tam was so young when we got married, she was 19 when we got married. So she went mm. from school, she went straight into hairdressing, oh, wow. and we got she got married. She's we we honestly went. We just want to like enjoy. Everything had been like next, next, next mm. for her, and, and for me, it was just like we just want to enjoy life. So for four or five years, didn't like didn't try to have kids, and then like okay, we'll we'll, we'll you know not start trying, but we'll you know let it happen if it happens. Didn't happen. Okay, we're going to start trying to have you know have a kid, and we went on for a long time. Um, and what began was. Um, you know, after you try for a while, you get some tests done to find out why why you're taking a while or something wrong. And all the doctors, they tested me, tested her. She had like invasive surgery to check things and everything, and they couldn't find anything wrong with either of us. And the doctors, after I think a year and a half of this, mm. called it um, inexplicable infertility, which is... Um, I don't know. Yeah. Like that, it's them saying, I yeah. don't know. Yeah, right. So, which I found worse than if something was wrong yeah. because it's like, okay, something wrong with me, something wrong with her, well, we can deal with that. Tragic, but we'll, we'll deal with that. We'll solve We'll solve this or we know what to do. But the I don't know was quite hard. So, we it's not for everyone, but we went down the road of IVF and we did... Um, I think it was five years of IVF and mm. did um, we, we spent every dollar we had over those five years and um, it was by far, by far the hardest, most grueling um, season of my life. Um, it was insane just what to me I had to go through in a body, injecting yourself in the stomach every day, to, ended up was black with bruising um, around her gut, the drugs. So she was on drugs, on these, there was always some sort of drug in the system for five years. And she was, um, um, you know, and, and as, a, as a husband, I just sit with her, hold her hand every morning, mm-hmm. every night, while she does it, she did herself. And, and, and we had miscarriages and we had um, we always harvested a great quantity of eggs. If you don't know IVF, you, you take drugs, a woman takes drugs to harvest as many eggs as possible. And then you fertilize them all and hopefully you get at least one, but as many as you can, f- usable fertilized eggs and one of them is implanted back in. So we would always get good quantity and then they would die off in the Petri dish over a few days and, and or we'd get one and we'd put it in and, and it either wouldn't take or, you know, and it's just like this hope crash, uh, crash. Like it, it was, um, on, honestly, 
just disgusting, like really, you know. Mm. Um, I was fr- angry, I was frustrated, I was sad, I was hopeful, I was happy. You know, we get it, you get a call, you, it has, it's worked, you're, you're pregnant. And then three days later, 10 days later, miscarriage. You know? how, how do you, like, how would you guys handle that as a team? Like, I know you're in that together there and that's just, it was multiple times that it happened. Multiple, multiple. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, look, I think it, it does, it, it definitely does um, uh, pull a lot of relationships or marriages apart. It, it can do that. Um, for us, um, our faith was very important to us in that, so we, we, we did pray a lot and did just find our peace in that. Um, we had good friends around us, so good, good people, like parents and family, and so we definitely didn't, we're very private natured people. We're not, which is funny because I'm in a very public, transparent, mm. vulnerable role. But it's my temperament is very private. And even that was a battle because I had to measure what do I share? What don't I share? What's, what's mm. oversharing? What's undersharing? Yeah. Like I even re- wrestled with that. Like I remember I was, I'd flown to one of our churches in South Australia and I, I got a phone call like 10 minutes before I was due to get up and speak and I ran outside his tent to me and I ran outside to take the phone call and she said, she said, oh, I miscarried and, and, and it's sort of like, I'm not there. Mm. She had to go to the hospital, wipe the tears off my face and walk back up and, and be the, and be what people need, you know? Wow. Be, no, not not be not be fake, but you want to be inspiring. You, I don't yeah. want to dump on people, and I want to always share from a place of not not necessarily victory in that you've beaten it, but at least a sense of you're not victim. Like, mm. yeah, and so it, yeah, like those sorts of days. So yeah, we we definitely pulled together a lot. We did every step together, and mm. I think that's something that helped us. As I went to all the appointments with her. I sat with her while she did 95% of her needles and, and all that sort of stuff. So I'm a pro man on all, oh, uh, man. all those syringes and all those vials <laughs> and all those drugs and all the, watching her holding her hand while she's going through these painful procedures mm-hmm. and and just oh, as a as a guy, you know, we we tend to be the the protector or that's what we want to be and to to see her in that sort of state, man. Far out. I, I felt they're, they're, I honestly I felt useless. Mm. Mm. I remember the day that it changed um, for me is I remember um, I, I was praying, but I think it's an important thought to have even outside of praying. But I remember saying, I'm not going to let my happiness be determined by a baby. So I remember thinking, like, what if this never happens? Am I going to be miserable and walk around for the rest of my life? Like, I don't have what I wanted and I missed out. And and that day, I kind of, the whole crushing of the five years kind of lifted and I realised I I should be happy, I should be at peace, not not because of a person, not not because Mm. of someone else. (laughs) And that and that day was it was almost it was that day was like that's what this has been about for me. Mm. That's the lesson that has been trying to get into my my life for the last five years and I'm probably a slow learner I'm not going to let my happiness be decided by a baby and so then we spent our last dollar and we had nothing left. we we weren't they always say if you want to go on another round of IVF you've got to decide if you're physically able to if you're financially able to and if you're emotionally able mm-hmm. to and um, to me uh her body was breaking down. Her emotionally, we were like, like you know, we were just kind of numb, like just walking through every procedure. Now it was just like, mm. yeah, next, yeah, no matter what, what body part you need today, kind of thing. I said, we'll do one more time. This is it. We, we can't do it again. We, we'll, we'll rest it from here because we also didn't want to push and we didn't similarly we didn't want to manufacture and make this thing happen. Because yeah. It's, we, we manipulated this thing. Forced. We forced it, yeah. you know. And the day they rang and they said to, to me, oh, oh, we probably need to get filled with you for this. To me, it's first thought, oh, okay. But I was standing out at the front door, she said, babe, get the um, IVF, Australia's called. And, um, 
and this, these are the nurses that we've done five years with. Mm. And they, yeah, right. And they screamed on the yeah. phone <laughs> and we screamed back at them. And now I've got this incredible um, 18-month-old Eurasian, yeah. healthy, beautiful little daughter, Suki. Mm. She's just the joy of my life. So we get pregnant, right? Two weeks later, Tamiya develops this incredibly rare condition called hyperemesis that like 1% of women get or something, where or every doctor who ever listened to this is probably going to say I'm wrong in how I describe this. But my understanding is hyperemesis is where the baby, the fetus, instead of taking, so Tamiya eats, instead of taking its portion of the nutrients, takes all the, all the nutrients. Wow. So Tamiya, for the eight months that the pregnancy lasted, was cr- life-threatening critical. So two weeks after we got that phone call and screen, we booked a holiday in Singapore, baby moon. Like mm. I was yelling at like, we're finally, like, and then my wife turns into this corpse um, and she got down to 36 kilos pregnant. Wow. And yeah, like pregnant. 36 kilos and was on trans uh, she was on drips every two days she was getting blood transfusions we were getting phone calls in the middle of night go to emergency now you need an iron transfusion a potassium transfusion and she was bedridden like i i i had very few conversations with her the whole pregnancy she was all all of her friends i would say 90 percent 95 percent of her friends saw her once during her pregnancy and it was her baby shower when the doctors came around to our house um, an hour before a baby shower injected her with, with, with there's a drug called um, ondansetron which is a cancer chemotherapy cancer drug wow. injected her with heaps of it because she got about an hour or two of, en- of energy from this drug mm. so we planned this party they came around injected her and she was up for a party and then Crush. crashed and the next time I saw her was when we had a ba- had our baby, and she's on the delivery bed. Honestly, it's critical. She was gonna die. Like it mm. was. Um, the doctor said you must never ever have another baby because if you, if you get pregnant again, either you'll die or the baby will die. Mm. But because I'd had that resolution of I'm never gonna let my happiness be based, I was like. I've got my gift. I've got my miracle. Mm. I've got my blessing. I don't need anything else. I'm, and so to me, it was throwing up on the delivery bed. She was throwing up like 40, 50 times a day. She, she was, she just, it was honestly like, I thought we've been through our trial with the IVF. Oh, okay. We're, we're tacking on another little bit here. Yeah. Mm. And, um, she was just bedridden. It's disgusting. So she's on, on the delivery bed vomiting. They take Suki out and to me, a stop vomiting and was like uh, food please and was eating chili con carne an hour after having suki wow and the human body unbelievable wow. so it was the fetus is out the body went okay done wow. and so suki is a supercharged baby like this yeah. like, she's just amazing and um super healthy to me is healthy and i've got my family back and I just, I'm, I'm just feel like the richest bird ever. Like, it's just amazing. Absolutely. What a roller coaster. Yeah. And how, how were you through that process? I mean, you, you would almost feel helpless at times. Yeah, being- I um, sunk my uh, free time into training in the gym, um, it, part, partly because I needed some sort of structure in this unstructured um, world. So mm. That's where I met you and you guys and that. I was here at 4 a.m. every morning um, and usually a second time of the day. So I, I handled it by, I can't control any of this. So I'll introduce some things that I that are consistent and can anchor me through it all. So I think just having some structured habits and structured time, that got me through it and then having the right people around me. and. Um, you know, there were certain people who in that time just really came quite close and present and would make me laugh mm. or, or make me, you know, it, I didn't need, you know, yeah. stroking and are you okay? Partly because I'm not that kind of temperament person. I needed people who could just, you know, I guess, uh, give me my energy, 
impart energy to me. Mm. Yeah. Um, yeah. How was your relationship with Eugene at that time? Um, yeah, Eugene, I, I met about a year before this, we, we, before the pregnancy. So we were in mm. the back end of IVF and, and I met him as a trainer. Um, and uh, again, we're from very different walks of life. So it, I only ever expected it to be a trainer client relationship, mm. but he, he was, is a very compassionate and discerning kind of person and he could start to read I guess you PTs can do that. You see someone re- re- regularly, you can start to read them. And so he he um, started to ring me right when I needed to be rung, and 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 a friendship developed where he um, yeah he gave me a lot of that energy and laughter and uh, uh, what's the word um, just a sense of I guess joy if that's the right mm. word because it, I was finding none of that. Like it was mm-hmm. head down, let's get through this. Everything was work at work. And I had, I went home to work. Like it was, you know, um, so to have someone who was doing that. Plus, I think this was great and I think it's a good lesson for people. He, he wasn't from church world for me. And so it was someone who was entirely <laughs> disconnected and unrelated to anything that, because it, it, it just becomes, when you, you know when you go through a hard time, it can just become so insular. Yeah. And so it was great having someone who was just outside of that mm. and actually kept me, oh, there's more. If I didn't have someone like him, I actually would have, like I would have got through it, but I, I would have missed out on, hey, this isn't, doesn't have to be a funeral march. Mm. This can be, you know. Um, so he, he was a real gift to me in that, in that time and we're still great friends and um, I think he's a great guy. And, but he was really... He, he stepped in in that season and surprised me that I hmm, I actually need need what he's giving me. Mm. You mentioned you mentioned a couple of times seasons. Um, what what do you mean by that? Yeah, I'm sorry if that's a Christianese kind of. No, religion. that's okay because I've heard it. I've actually heard it in multiple um, yeah. areas. Yeah. So I'm interested to interested no, to I know. Think, I think nothing's permanent. Like every, every you just think of even practically. Um, oh, we think of seasons, uh, <laughs> summer, autumn, winter, winter, winter spring. <laughs> uh, each of those seasons have a characteristic. You know, summer is the, you enjoy, so everyone enjoys summer, that's you get yeah. out, enjoy it. Autumn, you start to feel the, 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 the drying up, the, the closing down. Winter, hibernation, spring, newness. And I think even career-wise, you do experience those things where mm-hmm. you've got a summer season in your career, things are pumping but then you you get pruned you get things dry up oh i'm Mm. in a bit of an autumn Mm. um okay i'm not getting the favor or the opportunity or the success the platform that i was having in summer oh what's going on it's autumn like winter hibernation dig deep you know all that and the reason i think understanding reading seasons well is just like you know farmers reads they don't they don't harvest all year they don't sow all year they they behave according to what the season needs. So they'll get a good crop next year if they handle spring well, autumn well, winter well. Mm-hmm. And I think our careers, our relationships, you just gotta know the season and, and not just always behave like it's summer. Yeah. Like if you just, if you just like, ah, the hot for, for constantly, you're actually missing, you, it, you, you're missing what the opportunity. If you had dug deep and actually spent a season sowing, mm-hmm. not just behaving like, yeah, you'll meet you, you miss on the reaping so yeah, yeah if that yeah. makes sense don't just mm. party hard if you study if you educate yourself you'll actually reap from that later mm. you know, mm. that kind of concept so much of that um i was actually talking to andrew about so much of that's coming back to me now um oh it would have been when we first met i had my own stuff that i that i was trying to work through at that time and yeah again when you when you're in such a dark place you feel like you, you do, you can't get out of it and, and your whole world is that thing. But I remember you um, invited me to come to one of your talks and there was this whole idea of, and I hadn't, you know, Catholic and Christian background, but I hadn't been to church a whole lot. The way you guys do it is so different anyway. Um, but yeah, there was this whole idea of season and man, I was sitting in the, I was sitting there with friends that I was actually, you know, I was very fortunate to have in my life. Um, and I, I was breaking down, you know, like the, your ability to 
talk to people and connect to people and like I was saying before, to keep it balanced is so, so powerful and so important as well. Um, I guess that little lead into the mentoring world. Are you, you're mentoring people at the moment and I know probably not, you wouldn't call it mentoring, I guess, but um, you've helped me in, in many ways as well. So are you still doing that for people now? Yeah, definitely. So I've got my team that I um, personally one-on-one have coffees with, mentor, coach, um, and, you know, very intentionally, and I'll, I'll uh, uh, you know, it's my sort of close crew. Then beyond that, I'd have a circle of probably 40 or 50 people that I can looser, do what I can. And again, that's, it takes time. Um, you know, you can only mentor with time, yeah. and with contact. Um, yeah, and then, you know, to pass to the church, I've got that contact once a week. But no, I definitely, I'm very intentional. Um, I suppose with my faith, Jesus mentored yeah, his 12 disciples. Like he, he, that, he meant, that's literally discipleship is mentoring. You know, mm. he, he mentored them, he coached them. And so I, I do that and, and I, I get mentored once a week. I'll sit with, sit with my mentors and they'll um, ask me the hard questions and mm-hmm. you know, things. And, and if I can't take it, I won't grow, you know. Yeah. So I, I, I lean into it. The seasons where I've given my mentors and coaches a hard time are the seasons that I've been an idiot, like mm. never get out. So I just figure always, always lean into it. Um, but no, I, I definitely mentor. Mm. What do you, in your mentoring, without going into too much detail, of course, what, what do you cover? Is it is it an open is it an open field for whoever you've got in front of you to um, really uh, guide them or ask them the questions they need or do you stick to a certain um, criteria? Uh, The people that I'll I'll mentor usually have a specific role in our church or specific role, like there's a a specific function of our mentoring. Over time, I think it becomes much more of a well-rounded holistic because you can't help but, you can't coach someone in their career without touching on why you stress, why, you know, is this friendship taking you towards that or away from it? And, and so, mm. you know, but I, I, I mentor just by asking questions. Yep. Yeah. Nine, nine times out of 10, um, I'll ask questions. What do you think? Someone will come with me with an issue. I go, well, what do you think about that? Often they've actually already got the truth inside them and it's just drawing it out. And, mm. I, and I don't, you know, I don't have to sound smart, but you know, they just, they, Tell them they teach themselves. Yep. Um, but yeah, I just ask questions and guide, and and you know, there are some people who need a con- and it's usually a temperament thing, an aptitude thing. Some people need constant. Some people happy for you know, hmm. you know, some time between. I just give people what they need. I don't. Yeah, you know, I just I, I think it's important that you know mentor people the way I want to be mentored. I have to mentor them the way they need to be mentored. Yeah. And if they're a feeler they need the time. If they're a thinker, they need time to process and come back to me. If they're a doer, they need an action list. You know, so yep. just appreciating that and celebrating that and mm. never ever um, restricting that. Mm. I, um, I've been to church a couple of times. I'm not, um, I'm not Christian. I'm not religious in any way, but I've been to church, always gotten something out of it, always. Yeah. And um, I, th- I think part of that is having I've been invited in by people so you've got those connections but also going with an open mind and looking around but for someone who has never been to church before or someone who is thinking about it what's um what would you I guess say um to inspire them to come what is what is it about church that you believe people really get a lot out of yeah I think um two things I think the huge sense of community like church is a church there's a phrase of church family Mm -hmm. and and i grew up this was my friendship circle my mentor circle my net then became my 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 romantic circle all all from it's a it's a great community um and there's a there's a verse in the bible iron sharpens iron and and i find being in church does that you're Mm -hmm. constantly being and what it means iron sharpens iron mean you know, you, 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 it's actually contact with people that shapes us and refines us and helps us. Mm-hmm. And being in a church just promotes that consistency of relationship. So I think church community, um, but also especially our church, it's inspirational. It always speaks to your purpose, your potential, 
your mm. your vision, your you can change the world. God's got a plan for your life. It's never punishment, judgment. It's never condemnation. It's always grace, peace, joy, change the world, go, mm. go, you know. And and I pride myself on I, I would say 20% of the people in our Sunday services are Christian. Mm-hmm. And I, I just think that's unreal because I, I just think that speaks to it's a community that doesn't judge and does embrace and every, everyone's on their journey. I think people don't come to church for, um, for reasons that I think, hey, you, you, can, you can definitely come, especially to our church, but like church is a place that, that should be a great experience, an encouraging experience. You should walk out with some information and some impartation. So mm-hmm. you should walk out understanding a bit more, but also feeling a bit more. Yeah, yeah. absolutely. The rhyme? Dr. Zeus there. You, you flowed, you flowed. <laughs> um, or Dr. Phil. Hey! hey. Like that. I think it's been taken. I've never heard that. <laughs> yeah, <no. laughs> um, yeah, I, I mean, from what I've seen, you're you're definitely a leader within the community that you've got here. Um, how how would you like the people that you're closest with and in that community to remember you if you were to to ever leave us? Um, uh, I would like them to remember me. Um, do you mean what what would I like to leave behind? Is that what you mean? Yeah, like I guess your your legacy, you could say. Yeah, I'd like them to feel um, encouraged by me. Yeah. Um, not solved by me, not fixed by me, um, but encouraged by me. Mm-hmm. I, I, I really hope that your interactions for me, your encouraged, you're inspired. Um, yeah, that, that, that's my hope. Awesome, yeah. awesome. And um, before we get on to the last one or two questions, where can people find you if they did want to reach out or just follow you, see what you're about? Instagram, um, man. Yeah, my yeah. So I'm on Instagram. You got Phil. Um, Mitch really loves that. You got <laughs> Phil. You got that. Phil. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, I love it. I've had that since I since <laughs> Instagram and Twitter. Well, Should first we tell exist- the story? No, we're fine, Mitch. We'll move on. <laughs> um, and uh, I'm gonna- Phil is just very oh. immature. Everyone listening. Yeah, yeah. Uh-huh. like he comes with like, a you know, you know, mature interview. If you're listening but- to this now and you want to hear the inside joke. <laughs> so basically, I want, I want I want people to feel about me the opposite to the way Mitch makes me feel. That's basically my goal. Oh, love, <laughs> come on, it's true. Love to. I have secretly messaged Mitch and said I actually think he's a great guy. Yeah, but, <laughs> we do like. Joe. Um, uh, yeah, I'm on. Yeah, true. Fact. But I, I just think, yeah, and also I'm at church every week. I'm at Impact mm-hmm. full time, so I'm walking around the gym all the time. I'm in, I'm at church every Sunday. It's my, you know, I would love people to feel like they can come to church on a Sunday morning mm, at 9.30. Yeah. And I, I do think it's a really funny, it's funny. It's, you laugh a lot, you learn a lot, you connect a lot. It's honestly, it's yeah. the best hour and a quarter, hour and a half mm. of my week. Like, it really yeah. is mm. an amazing experience. And I mm. just think, why not? Like, what what do you have to lose? And you've yeah. got so much to gain. Mm. And so that's... Yeah, I can. I mean, I can vouch for that. And yeah. and as as someone who isn't religious, it's you really do get that out of it. Yeah. And um, I, I guess for each person, it's how they perceive the experience as well. Yes. Um, but I mean, if you go in openly, you're going to get an amazing amount of value. Um, and coffee. And there is coffee. Is it good coffee? It is not bad at all. Yeah. It's no, not it's bad. Good. Cool. Yeah. I'm in for that. Um, I wanted to ask you, do you have any advice that that huge leap that you took from the, the law path to the pastor, um, what advice would you give any young people um, thinking that they want to make a big change or they want to take that leap, but they're not sure whether to do that or not. I can easily answer that. My, my mentor once told me three things when you're making a major choice, and I've lived by this, three things to consider. Number one is your peace. You know, if you're in, like I had my integrity. My, my mind was saying, do the educational law stuff. Not there's anything wrong with that. To all the lawyers listening, you're amazing. <laughs> um, um, but my heart was saying this. So my, pe- my peace, I'd lost my peace. I was stewing about it. I was frustrated with it. I was, I couldn't. So you listen to your peace. And if you don't have your peace, you, you, no one should live like that. Every, you, you should make career choices and major life choices. You've got to have your peace. Because you've got to be able to look yourself in the mirror and go, I've spent 
whatever long. Mm. So you listen to your peace, listen to your counsel, listen to your advisors, your counsellors, like I did. I was with my parents, my coaches, my pastors, my friends, mm. and I listened. Um, and like I said, that first window, there was a mm-mm, and so I, I listened to that so that the next time when they said yes, I was like, sweet, oh, mm. I've got this. Mm. And then the last thing is circum- listen to circumstances. So peace, counsel, and circumstances. And by circumstances, I mean it would be um, – wrong circumstantially for me now with a new baby to do a dramatic career change where i am lost my income. Mm-hmm. So circumstantially, it's idiotic. So circumstantially, I think there needs to be wisdom and consideration for that. And I think sometimes, okay, you've got to solve that circumstance problem. You've got to put something in place so that uh, I think some guys ignore that. They think, yep. they think it's all just the inspiration of, yeah, I've got it in my heart, and my friend said it's a great idea. Yeah. So go. Mm. Yeah, but you got it. You don't want to be eating magic noodles for three years. Yeah. Interesting. Yeah. But you know what I mean? Like you've got to, you've got to watch that, and that's what parents freak out about. That's what mentors and people freak out about. And it's like they're not wrong. Like mm. they're wrong if that's the only factor. That they're. That, that it's it's not the only thing to consider. And you're a parent yeah. now, you can give that advice. Yeah, yeah it's true. So you can, <laughs> we'll never do anything wrong in the life. <laughs> you know, it's not circumstances isn't the only thing to consider. Money isn't the only thing. There are there is family impact, there is your heart impact, your health impact, all these things. But it's got to be something. You know, don't mm. be an idiot and throw your life away because you just you, you, you loved up or you liked up. Yeah. Yeah, but if you're going to move to Argentina and mm. what does that mean? You know. Yeah. You know, yeah, that was very specific. <laughs> um, awesome, man. Last question. Um, what, what advice would you give to yourself? Um, you've got everything you have now. What advice would you give your your younger self if you take yourself back to probably a time when you were most troubled um, in those late teenage years or into your twenties? Well, what piece of advice would you give yourself? Um, I would say um, you're better than you think you are Mm. Um, and I hope that the effect of that would be quicker confidence and stronger confidence Mm. Uh, I I definitely was someone full of self-doubt and insecurity and Harry Potter glasses and it it was just I I would say to myself you're better than you think you've got more to offer than you think you do don't mm. dismiss what you've got mm. um, I would say that and I would and I would probably remind myself always stay integrous like don't don't do stuff that eats away at your character and eats away at your thinking don't do stuff secretively mm. because it's that stuff that's usually bear the seeds of problems down the track mm. and I, I think I've been a relatively integrous and 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 an honest person, but there's definitely things that I've, you know, you make massive mistakes and stupid stuff on the journey. Yeah. I would remind us of stay as, stay as integrous as possible. And I love that. Me That's too. Such a good answer. Um, man, thank you so much. So, so much for coming on today. Um, your time, we appreciate massively. We're so happy for you and your family after everything you guys have gone through. And it's, you know, Suki's definitely what you could call a miracle. So. Yeah. Um, again, if you want to reach out to Phil, don't hesitate to send him a message. I know he'll, he'll uh, help you out like he did me as well. So, man, thank you for your time. Unreal. Thanks, boys. Cheers. Cheers. Awesome.